Hey guys, welcome to Cashcroft TV. My name is Kalen Ashcroft. Thanks for tuning in to another video on ancient Greek and Roman history. Today we will be doing Lysander, going back in terms of our Greek timeline to the time of Alcibiades, who was from ancient Sparta, a Lacedaemonian, and Scylla from ancient Rome, about the exact same time as Marius, our last Roman life, or live as it is in Plutarch's case. So, without further ado, let us begin. Um, oops, trigger finger. Okay, so Lysander was born of Heracle Day bloodline, meaning he was related to Her Hercules. Despite this, he had no royal blood in Sparta, and he was supposedly reeled in poverty. So he came from a very meager upbringing, which wasn't saying too much because no, the wealth gap in Sparta wasn't that huge because it was pretty much a social state. But nonetheless, he had no royal blood and he was a self-made man. He, it was said that he was superior to every pleasure in that he would abstain from all the indulgences of life and lived a very frugal being. It was said in terms of an anecdote, Dionysius the historical famous tyrant of sicily offered his two daughters dresses lysander's two daughter dresses dresses and he refused them saying that they would make them ugly it was not that these were actually quite supposedly quite beautiful dresses but it was that he just didn't like the indulgences and he didn't even want his own daughters to have this despite this he later ends up achieving a great amount of wealth for sparta and leads to everyone else falling into these indulgences and pleasures but he himself abstains from it his whole life which is a good good point for him but it's not a necessity for success as you will see with Scylla with that it said that he was content to endure arrogant authority for the sake of gaining ends so with that it was that he was very respectful to authority and through that he managed to gain political power Plutarch reflects that this is a political ability to be able to suck up essentially this is pretty much common in every one of Plutarch's lives and every, I would say, successful businessman, every successful politician, and even successful artist. They have to be able to suck up to superiors in order to gain mentorship and gain achievement or gain um, rise up the ranks in any respective, go up the, the pyramid it is, of any respective pursuit. Aristotle said... Plutarch says Aristotle said, I'm pretty sure he says this, I've read some Aristotle, but I've never found it in any of his books, but he must have said it. Uh, great nature like Plato Her and Hercules have a tendency, Hercules and Socrates have a tendency to melancholy. And he also points to Lysander saying that in later life he fell into melancholy, so melancholy. So supposedly he was a bit of a depressive, which is, um, I think, interesting. I think a lot of these individuals have it, despite their great success there still can never satisfy this certain void they have within themselves, which is sort of sad. That kind of adds to the tragedy. But um, it's said that Lysander had very long hair, which was very common, or it was the norm in Sparta. Plutarch says that Lys Lycurgus said, long hair makes good-looking men more beautiful and ill-looking men more terrible. So with that, Sparta for centuries maintained long hair as... Uh, uh, just to attain a better uh, overall appearance and that was something that was not different in the case of Lysander. So essentially he proves himself to be of good character and wins the affection of many of the higher-ups and wins the the position of admiral in the Peloponnesian War. It's technically the second Peloponnesian War but it's just called the Peloponnesian War for I guess because it was just the bigger one. There's also a first Peloponnesian War, so try not to get confused there. But the Peloponnesian War was that between Sparta and Athens. So at the time, Alcibiades was the general of the navy, and he established a huge navy for Athens, which was a very good decision on his part. But he was slowly running out of favor in his own respective state, that being Athens. With that... And he was even getting a lot of opposition. A lot of conservatives didn't want him to establish the fleet. But Alcibiades was quite right in this regard. And I'm a pretty big fan of Alcibiades, so I'll stand by that as well. But Lysander was selected to be admiral to face him by sea. And they were 
must at a, much at a disadvantage, at least Lysander was at a disadvantage and with, with respect to the war. But as Alcibiades is falling out of favor, his, his uh, sub-general, his subordinate, Antikos, sort of ruins the Athenian fleet by going in and, um, and showing off and ultimately loses a little micro-battle and ultimately Alcibiades gets punished for that and banished from or ostracized from Athens which was quite unfortunate for both Athens and Alcibiades but very good thing for Sparta, Lysander and their uh, side of the Peloponnesian War. He also was very good at befriending people so as I said he was very good at like sucking up to people but he also made a very good friend friendship with Cyrus the Younger of Persia and they he won the affection of him and they became very good friends and he sort of supported him in terms of financing and in terms of troops throughout the whole Peloponnesian War and he was very careful in terms of making this a relationship between just him and Cyrus so when ultimately he get is no longer admiral and Callicratides becomes the admiral of Sparta because the uh, admiral could only run once in Sparta Cyrus begins stopping his funds Lysander also tells Cyrus to stop his funds, and Cyrus willingly does this, so this very much weakens the admiralship of Callicratides. Similarly, Lysander made many allies around Athens who were willing to support them in the Peloponnesian War, and they, these allies seem to not support Callicratides. So it's kind of, or I kind of view this as Lysander not being, his interests were not aligned with Sparta necessarily. He did not want Sparta to just win he himself wanted to achieve the glory and he was willing to sacrifice his his co-leaders for that so with that even though a spartan leader could only want run once he, he is elected as sub admiral but with all intensive purposes he still had admiralship and he was still pretty much in charge of the spartan army to kind of uh, prove some of his deceitful deceitfulness there's a couple quotes since he became from he came from Her hercules bloodline he says where lion's skin will not reach it must be patched with foxes so this is a testament to his belief that there is room for trickery even in the most noble souls and he definitely proved to do this he also says cheat boys with knuckles and men with oaths so that's just also a testament to his harsh behavior and trickery once again so with that they ultimately forced the athenians to capitulate with his allies and with the help of cyrus and they he ultimately manages to take over athens he forces athens to give up many of their historical laws and he instills a government called the 30 tyrants which was an oligarchy and they were very violent and very cruel to the Athenian people. Alcibiades goes down to Persia. Persia at that point had a new leader and he tries to get them to join the Athenians in helping them restore their democracy and overthrow the Spartan rule. But Lysander on hearing this sends assassins to go and kill Alcibiades. And here's a pretty tragic looking picture of it. Alcibiades getting um, killed. He's actually killed by arrows, ultimately. I don't know why they're holding these, but it's a famous photo, so, or painting, so we'll just uh, take it with a grain of salt. Um, but yeah, very tragic. He sends the assassins to do it. He does it very unnobly. He does not go in and do it himself, but uses paid mercenaries to do it. I think it's pretty sad. Alcibiades was, um, in my opinion, a better man than Lysander, and that's a minus one for Lysander in that regard. But either way, the Athenians ultimately end up able to throw, overthrow the Spartan government in the Battle of Pyrrhus, and they reestablish the democracy, and they slay many of the 30 tyrants that were ruling Athens at the time. Despite this, Lysander still has a lot of fame and notoriety in Sparta and even amongst his allies, which is strange, and I guess this is just kind of part of his character. He was just... Had, despite all his poor actions and ill behavior, he could always win the affection of the people, and they still didn't give up on him in that regard. He starts a war with Thebes, because Thebes starts 
rebelling against the tyrants that he put in um, Thebes. So basically, ab ab around a bunch of the regions after the Peloponnesian War, Sparta essentially had a hegemony. They almost controlled all of Greece, and they instilled tyrants, ol oligarchs, who were willing to uh, succumb to Spartan rule to rule their own respective states. But Thebes starts uprising, and Lysander and sends an army to go and stop this revolt. But he goes up too close to the wall, and he is killed. So kind of, kind of like Achilles, and um, Achilles is killed by Paris at the at the gates of Troy, by arrow, but um, maybe not as gallantly in Lysander's case. But either way, that's how he dies. Prior, just prior to dying, he puts in this new government, new leader, Agelos the Second, who was kind of like his uh, mentee. But he sort of starts seeing how corrupt Lysander is, and by the time Lysander dies, he almost fully disagrees with everything that um, Lysander instilled, and he pretty much r gets rid of all of his laws. But regardless, Sparta was very wealthy at this time, and but very corrupt as well. He, it is said that he, in Plutarch's lives that he was the first Greek to be considered a god in his own lifetime, which I think is strange, because there must be others, but... That's, that's how it ended up. So, yeah, I think that's everything here. I suppose let's move on to Scylla. So, I'm very excited about this this one, actually. I guess just uh, one thing to his, to his character. He... No, that's not true. Okay, moving to Scylla. So, Scylla was born from a pretty, it was historically a pretty powerful family, uh, Root, but they fell out of favor because his father, Rufin, or one of his ancestors, Rufinus, had been counsel, but he was caught holding a, like 10, it was actually exactly 10 pounds of silver plates. So they kind of fell into austerity and poverty it's said that he lived in cheap lodgings throughout his whole youth at one time he was criticized how can you be an honor honest man who since the death of a father had left you nothing you have become so rich um, but despite this Sulla was very contra very much contrast lysander in his indulgences he was always partying he would all throughout his whole life even until old age he ultimately dies from having a supposedly liver failure from drinking so much he was always partying he had many wives both and um ma male lovers as well he was very indulgent always partying but he still managed to achieve a lot and he is probably the for him and maria so the foremost causes of the ultimate collapse of the republic of rome and the the rise of the roman empire which we will start to see. He it said he was Scylla actually means like spotted face. I um but despite this he was considered to be very beautiful, very godlike. He had very um drilling eyes and very godlike features and it gave him a certain confidence throughout his whole career and he believed he was something more than just a man. He had often girls falling in love with him, and that's how he ultimately achieved his wealth. This wealthy girl and her mother fell in love with him, and she died, and the mother gave him all the wealth, and that's how he sort of got his start. He eventually is selected by Marius to be his subordinate, his quaestor, and they go into this war, and essentially Bacchus chooses to give... Jugathra to Lysander rather than his own stepson and ultimately they win over the war and this undermines Marius because Scylla sort of gets all the fame for this Scylla makes himself his own ring so it's very cocky he's very boastful very vain and it's really sorts to upset Marius but Marius believes that since he's so much younger 
and so much below him. He keeps sort of investing him and keeps using him as a subordinate and keeps winning as a result of Scylla's ambition and success. Eventually, he believes it to be too much, but Scylla quickly moves to another mentor who's quick to invest in him and quick to help him rise through the ranks. He At one point, he, this guy named Censorinus tries to impeach um, Scylla, but he doesn't even show up. And at the same time, Bacchus starts glorifying Scylla, so he just keeps growing more and more powerful. Around this time, a seer told him he would die at the height of his fame and fortune, and he always sort of feared this, and he always kind of, maybe that's one of the reasons why he drank and partied so much, he believed he would die a very sudden death, and he, he knew it would, he was willing to live his life at risky. Um, yeah, after he returns from Apidum Apadosin, after repelling the Armenians, he sides with the op teams. So there's it's what's called the social war, which was done, which existed between the op deems and populaires. So it was basically the oligarchy, the wealthy class against the populist. So despite Marius, Marius was originally the populist. He was the one who grew the army so much by allowing all people to run. Lysander, although also he was a more for the oligarchs, he actually had the affection of the military because Marius was starting to get old and Lysander was the much better general. So although he had the oligarch vote, he also had the military vote. So he was becoming very powerful and even the populace couldn't suppress him. The upper class feared, uh, the, the lower class wanted more power but the upper class really feared Marius as well because Marius had been consul six times and this really threatened the upper class. So with that, there's a sort of outbreak and there's an assassination of Marcus Drassus and this really upsets the Sashi who are pretty much the, the, popul- the, the plebs, the plebeians. And there starts to be a bunch of uprises amongst the Roman cities. But Scylla suppress, captures Achillon and sort of settles the war. He gets this wreath crown called the Obsidian Crown, Corona Obsidionis, or also the Grass Crown as well, which is considered the greatest honor that one can get in terms of a general for... It's not for a victory, it's for saving the army. So it, it's, yeah, very difficult to get and very, yeah, you've probably seen it before. It's the, the wreath crown, but it this picture might not be accurate because it's taken from the battlefield, so they could look different, but it's essentially a grass crown from the battlefield. So he is elected for consul, and he really wants to go on this more of the Mithriandactic War which was in Athens. Athens is having an uprising. There are a few uprising amongst the Greek states and even as far as Asia. Rome was very large at the time. But, and he blocks the, this certain legislation as to speed up the, the, the amalgamation of the army. But there starts to be a bunch of riots and he hides in Marius' house. Unfortunately, his own son dies. But he eventually escapes and he goes off to start preparing his army. His army at that time was very well seasoned for after winning the social war, after reclaiming Aklanum. So they were all ready for the war. But in the meantime, Marius sort of goes in a sort of de- deceitful action. He offers some of the politicians to erase their, dre- their debts, some of the tribunes, to erase their debts if they remove Scylla from consul. And this was considered, it wasn't a written rule that this was illegal, but it was against tradition. And Scylla is no longer consul, and Marius gets it. This probably marks probably the most important point in all of Roman history next to, next to Julius Caesar crossing the Rubicon. This might have even been more important because it set the precedent. So upon hearing the news, his army starts throwing rocks at the messenger and he sets off to t- attack Rome. 
um, with the army. So he was about to take the Rome by force. Most of the generals didn't want to go with him. They were worried that it would be dangerous, but amongst the lower class soldiers, they were all in support of him, and he shows up with six legions. Marius tries getting the gladiators to defend the city. He even offers to free all the slaves if they fight, but the only supposedly three slaves showed up, and Scylla takes over Rome. He actually, rather than forcing himself as dictator, which he could have done and he essentially did, and he later does, he kind of takes the defensive and says that he was the victim. And he takes the consulship back for himself and he declares Marius, his rival, as a enemy of the state. Kind of surprisingly, though, he still decides that he wants to go on the Mithriantic War. So he leaves all the way to Greece. And in the meantime, Marius was building an army in Africa and goes and attacks Rome and takes it for himself once again. Which was, I think, very surprising that Scylla did this, that he left Rome after just taking it. But I guess he just wanted more glory and he wanted to be on the battlefield in that regards. And he proved himself to be a very great general down there. Many individuals even show up to Athens while he's there who wanted to leave under Marius's rule, which had been killing off and uh, murdering many of supporters of Scylla. With that, though, eventually Scylla decides to return. And on the way, most of the armies that of Marius's armies didn't even surrendered to Scylla's army. So this time, Scylla left two legions to protect Asia from further uprising and came back with five. On the way, Pompey, who later becomes the main rival of Julius Caesar, joins Scylla's army and at the age of 23, which was a very good political move for him and started seasoning his own army. With that, he ultimately takes Rome and, yeah, the battle is fought at the gates and supposedly 50,000 died, but this sort of established him as the dictator the actual dictator at this point used to be rome actually had in its legislation kind of like they have in canada the war measures act a a way in which a, an individual can be selected as a dictator for a six month period you know in time to struggle and it had been used for example in the punic wars against carthage against hannibal but both punic wars actually but yeah, with that, he, he held the position for much more than six six months, and he started killing off. It was uh, Scylla began to make blood flow, and supposedly as many as 9,000 people died. It said that 1,500 nobles died, but as many as 9,000 people died. They, It said that many of the people were not even killed because they were necessarily enemies of him, but it's because they wanted his property, and he just wanted to gain and protect his own wealth and he became extremely powerful. And one of the few people that got away, Sina's son-in-law. Sina was a supporter and close ally of, of Marius, gets away, and Sina's son-in-law was Julius Caesar. So he runs away, fortunately, to some supporters of Scylla, but he, later Scylla really regretted this. He said, in Caesar there are many Mariuses, and he really foresaw the excessive ambition that Julius had. And he proves this to be very much the case. Um, yeah, so he strengthened the Senate. He and he very much feared the people, as usual. He feared the tribune, and he took more and more people power away from the people. But one thing he didn't do was take take away power from the army. So the army just got more and more powerful, and particularly the generals who had their affection because the generals were in charge of the the fate of their soldiers. So they really gained a lot of political power and set later set a precedent for Julius Caesar establishing the empire. Eventually, when he gets old, he just pretty much walks out. He just finished and he he walks out unarmed without any guards and nobody chooses to oppose him, which is kind of kind of strange cuz even the the soothsayer said that he would die at the height of his power, but it ended up not being a strange death. He ended up just dying of alcoholism. He ended up partying. He went and lived. He retired with his wife and his male lover. 
Plutarch criticizes his male lover saying he wasn't even young, but like it's kind of very contradictory to today. Like now it would be considered pedophilia to have a young lover, but um, gayness is okay. Whereas back then gayness was not okay, but having a young lover was okay. So it's just kind of strange. But either way, he also had five wives. So I guess he was, um, he swaying both ways. But yeah, that's about it. He very much inspired Pompey as well. Pompey said, if Sulla can't, could, why can't I? And there are four operas written by him, by Mozart, Handel, Alfonsi, and Bach. There's also, um, and in these operas, he's, pers- he's shown as a sort of womanizer and excessively ambitious individual. So yeah, I guess we'll go to the comparison. So they both came from nothing, which is very obvious. Plutarch notes that the climb, though, for Scylla was more impressive just because the Roman hierarchy was much larger. The gap between the upper class and the lower class was much larger than in Sparta, where it was essentially a socialism and he didn't have to climb as much. It, they were both quite unethical in both their actions. They were both very deceitful. Um, yeah, I don't think that can be questioned on either regard for either regards. It said in strife, Plutarch said in civil strife, even villains rise to power, rise to fortune. So yeah, I guess, you know, you don't have to be good. You can be evil and earn just as much power as success, or maybe even more in terms of contrast, the, the, Lysander was obviously more moderate in terms of his pleasures, whereas Scylla was crazy. He was just constantly partying when he wasn't off killing and fighting battles, so very different in that regard. But it's said that Lysander caused his people to be indulgent, whereas Scylla didn't. Scylla caused his people to be actually more frugal and be more less indulgent. So he says that Lysander rose above the laws while while Scylla fell beneath it. So I guess that's an interesting contrast there. For Lysander, he achieved it not through he achieved his success not through force, really. He was pretty much loved by the Spartans, regardless of all of his wrongdoings, whereas Scylla really just thrust himself into power and took it and didn't let anyone ever tell him the word no. He points out that Scylla was undoubtedly the better general. Lysander pretty much got lucky in that Alcibiades had to leave, and he only uh, supposedly fought two real opponents, Plutarch says, whereas Scylla used massive armies of all different scales and all different geographies and was much greater in this regard. Similarly, he criticizes Lysander for being how foolish in dying at the gates as Achilles did and kind of points out that he didn't read any of his Homer, whereas Scylla won at the gates. He took the gates of Rome and slayed 50,000 right there. Um, I, he uses the isolated example of Athens as a, as a cool point of comparison when Scylla was protecting Athens, he let them restore their laws, whereas when Lysander took Athens, he forced them to change their laws. So with that that regard, he he sees Scylla as more just, but I still wouldn't call him a just guy. And yeah, that's about it in terms of Lysander and Scylla. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope that you watch the next one. Thanks so much.